people from downstairs? I don't see Christina. Did I miss you? I was supposed to get her. I forgot. Okay, so we're missing. Thank Christina you. I'm sorry. And anybody else? She's come up. Eagle eye. <laughs> All right. So anybody that needs a job, I have three applications for Mardell's. Mardell's is a Christian bookstore in Moore that is on Wadsworth by the Sam's Club and Hobby Lobby. They are now hiring. Kentucky Fried Chicken is now hiring at Bellevue in Santa Fe. Um, Savers is now hiring down on Littleton Boulevard. Um, yeah. Pet Boys on Wadsworth. Pep Boys on Wadsworth and Bellevue is hiring. Del Taco can't find anybody on Wadsworth is hiring. <laughs> Trader Joe's at Wadsworth and Bowles is still Trader Joe's at Wadsworth and Bowles. DU is hiring. DU is hiring. What are they hiring? Um, front of house, back of house, catering, dishwasher, cooks. Okay, in the cafeteria area, is that yes, what it is? Yes, and uh, <laughs> okay. All right, and then uh, just right here on Broadway and Orchard is CarMax, a big banner out front, now hiring at CarMax. King Supers is too. King Supers is hiring. And Home Depot is hiring right now like crazy for seasonal help. So if you need a job, there should be no reason why you don't have one. There's lots of people hiring. So this would be a fun place to work though, there. Okay. Uh, let's see. Tanner, this is yours. And Monica, this is yours. Okay. All right, so how are we all doing today? Okay, I want you to stir yourself up. We have something special today. Stand up and clap your hands. Come on, stand up. that have become invaluable to NBRC, Mary's Hope, and to me personally. They have gone above and beyond. And the first one that I want to recognize is Mr. William Moronas. great job um, that he has come through the ranks of Mary's Hope and is one of our house coordinators and then in addition to that anytime I call Billy and ask if he can pick somebody up and take them there or do this or do that you want to know what answer I get what you bet I can <laughs> you bet I he never says no he always says you bet I can and he's just become an invaluable person I love him, and so I want to honor you today. Thank you Thank for you, the Mary. good work. Thank you. Thank you. Number two, Roland, you right, come on up here. Where are there two seats two right here, Denise. We can scoot over. Oh, they'll scoot over right there. Thank you. We can have two seats right there. Oh, there's two right here. All right. Oh, actually, we'll move. 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 We'll move.
Thanks. All right, we're back focused now. All right, very good. So anybody that knows this man standing next to me loves him. There's not one person that does not like him or love him except for Tanner. And, you know, his opinion doesn't count. So, you know, I just am going to tell a little quick story about Roland. Roland called me, uh, it's been over a year ago, or a year ago, about a year ago, and he was calling from some remote place in Colorado Springs, outside of Colorado Springs, and I was talking to him on the phone, and he wanted to come to NBRC, and I thought, just from talking to him on the phone, I thought, I don't, I hope he doesn't come here. <laughs> I just really, I hope he doesn't call me back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, God works in mysterious ways. Not only did he call me back, but he was very persistent. Long story short, here he is today. He has been clean and sober for how long? Mm, seven months or so, maybe. Let's say seven eight or nine months. months. Yeah. Okay. Eight or nine months. <laughs> what Roland does he we offered him a little thing here and it was really just starting out to be a little thing he wanted to do more so we trained him to do low energy neural feedback he wanted to do more so he went out and got his Q map he wanted to do more so he went and became a peer counselor he wanted to do more so he makes this beautiful spa water downstairs every day is a little bit different he goes out of his way to do it. He comes to work when he's not scheduled to. We can't get rid of him. <laughs> but we love him, and you do an excellent job, and thank you so much. For yeah. Yeah. It's fun to have people that just go the extra mile for us, isn't it? Yep. So we have a surprise speaker this morning. It was a surprise to me too. And so I'm really excited about it though. And our uh, surprise speaker this morning is none other than my son, Christopher Brooks. Hey. So has now learned and is so fascinating is that the choices we make in life will alter how our genes are expressed. This is big. People need to really pay, up, pay attention to this because science is now confirming scripture. And in lectures that I do, I often ask the audience, which is more scientifically accurate, the Bible or Charles Darwin? Well, guess what? It's the Bible. Darwin hypothesized that it was mutation over millions of years that caused his finches to have different beaks. Science has actually now proved it's epigenetic modification. the instructions sitting above the genome telling the genes how to express themselves which are changed based on experience. What we go through in life, the foods that we make, the choices we make, uh, the environment in which we live will actually alter the genes in, in telling which genes to turn on and which genes to turn off. What we know about genetics and addiction is that behaviors, sensations, input into the brain will use the DNA to change how the cell responds. And basically what happens is that genes are turned off or turned on 
based on what that response is. While the DNA doesn't change, the expression does. So the ability to be aware of environment, the ability to respond may be genetically coded, but when we begin changing it, the term we use is epigenetically, when we change how that's expressed, we change the enzymes that are made, we change the response of the cell, and that change becomes a part of the genetic expression. one exposure to pornography. It's the repetitive volitional exposure to pornography um, that will cause this type of uh, gene expression to happen, such that you alter your pleasure circuits and you alter the inhibitory feedback, which would tell you not to do this. And that's epigenetic modification, changing your brain function. When we have kids, we not only give the sequence to our kids, we will pass along the instructions two and three generations down. And so if we become addicted to stuff, we can pass along to our kids gene constellations that make them more vulnerable to addictions. Conversely, if we get victories over stuff, we can actually pass along advantages. There's good animal evidence that that change in expression can be transmitted to the offspring. Those enzymes, those mechanisms, those genes that are turned off may also be turned off in the next generation. So we can pass along both positive things in our life and or negative depending on the choices we make in life. And so the Bible is actually more scientifically accurate than Charles Darwin because we do pass down to our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren the experiences that we go through in life based on the epigenetic modifications. They will get not only our genes, but the instructions of how those genes are expressed. Many adolescents will say things like, hey, it's my body, I can do what I want. Only if you're never going to have kids. If you're gonna have kids, it's not on your body, it's your kids, your grandkids, and your great-grandkids' body too, so be careful what you do with it. Don't think of it as a, as a battle you're just fighting for yourself. You're fighting for the very lineage that God gave you. And if you will break this curse, then your sons and your daughters have a better shot. And your grandchildren have a better shot. My son's name is Jubal Lee, because his dad took the courage to break the curses off of him. I want to invite you to the very same thing for those you love. Since we've been doing Jumpstart, I've been, I felt like I've been needing to bring this forward. I know that some of the people that have been through Mary's Hope have kind of heard a lot of this before. Um, but generational curses and your choices. So Exodus 34-7 says, keeping mercy for thousands, <coughs> forgiving iniquity and trans transgressions and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty punishing the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto third and fourth generations. So it's just what they were just talking about in the video, is that no matter what you know, I've gone through, my kids are going to go through, um, my grandkids are going to go through, my great-grandkids are going to experience it, unless something is done about it. Um, so you guys heard last week, um, you know, Mary talked about anger issues. Um, I was a very angry, angry, angry child at a very young age. Um, very violent. <laughs> Jim can contest. So, um, I was abused probably from starting about the age of two years old um, until about the age of, I believe, five or six when my father finally left. Um, he had the attitude and the belief that um, men don't sleep with lights on you know, and stuff like that. I have very vivid memories of my father um, abusing me, throwing me against the wall, beating me. Uh, one thing that's kind of funny is my mom came to me at one time and said, how do you remember that stuff? You know, you were two years old. And it's just something that has stuck with me ever since. Um, anger, 
is just the tip of it. I was a very volatile and very violent young man. Uh, I loved to fight. That was my, uh, that's what made me feel good. Um, I didn't care if it was for what reason it was. If you looked at me so much as sideways, it was on. Um, I was to the point where if I did get in a fight, it was I was always let you throw the first punch and I got you better than me. If you didn't, um, it was over. Uh, I black out um, and it gets pretty nasty. So my home room in junior high was basically the principal's office. My mother would take me, drive me to school every morning. She would drop me off and the principal would escort me to the classroom or to, my, to his office actually. And you know, there was a point that there was a part that, uh, you know, he allowed me to go to gym one day because he felt so bad about, about it. It lasted all of about two seconds before I got sent back to the principal's office. And it was just to the point where um, I didn't care. All I knew is that it made me feel good when I was fighting. You know, if I could inflict pain on somebody else, that's all it took. That's all it mattered. Um, so I wanted to get a little bit deeper um, into some, you know, into things. I remember at a very young age, um, my father had a uh, box of pornography in his basement that, uh, you know, I stumbled upon. So I was introduced to pornography and to anger um, at a very, very, very young age. And it followed me for a long time. Um, my father wasn't a father. He, um, he wasn't a role model, he wasn't a mentor, he was a very abusive, violent um, man. So, you know, so, so far we've got, we've got pornography in introduction, we've got rage and anger, we've got violence. Um, I found out that my father was smoking pot, at, you know, when I was very young, he was into the drugs. Him and his brothers used to grow it out of Elizabeth, Colorado on my Uncle Frank's farm. Um, so I was surrounded by drugs on both sides of my family. My uncle, um, Bobby, which is my mom's brother, he was a severe drug addict. Um, my mom got in the remarried when I was, I believe I was about six years old to a man by the name of Steve, um, who was an alcoholic and a drug addict as well. He was not a very nice man. He, um, he had some issues with my sister and with I, and, um, It just wasn't very good. It wasn't a good scenario. So um, all I wanted in life was a man to be my father, to love me, to care about me. Just to show me just an inkling of love in my life. That's all I wanted. And I could never find that. I, I strived with my uncle. My uncle um, ended up being what I thought was a role model. He was into motorcycles. Those that, love, those that know me know that I love motorcycles. Um, I started riding when I was about five years old. I've ridden ever since. I passed that on to my, uh, to my son and my children. And uh, so when I, when I started dating in high school, um, really in junior high, um, I wasn't a nice guy. Women were objects to me. Um, and I was just a sexual object. I think I had, I originally started, I think my first time I ever had sex when I was about 11 years old. Um, again, women were objects. I didn't treat them well. I didn't respect them. It was what could I get from them. Uh, an ongoing thing in high school with me and my friends was, is, you know, we'd go out to parties at night and it was, the goal was is to, of course, see how many panties we could bring along at night. And usually, uh, it ended up, you know, with a lot of women that were hurt, a lot of women that were left that were felt abandoned and, or used or whatever that may be. Um, so I was not a very nice kid growing up. Um, I went through, you know, in, in high school, as Jim well knows, um, I partied almost every night. There were parties at my house every night. Um, we drank, my, Brian and I, um, we drank until we passed out. I was a very volatile drunk, or I was a very emotional drunk. <laughs> and, uh, there was always an ongoing joke with, um, you know, Mary said that it, the night with me would either end with me in tears or in a fight. 
and that that's usually was my night when it didn't matter whether it was in, whether it was a school night whether it was a weekend or not i drank i did drugs and that was the gist of it that was my night through going through high school um so then i found i met this little girl uh in high school julie Lofman, which mary just loved she thought she was just a <laughs> That's an inside joke. She hated her. <laughs> she could not stand with this lady. Uh, but I thought that she was the one. I thought she was the one that I was going to, you know, of course, marry and, and all that stuff. Um, and it just didn't, didn't happen. Um, sorry, I know I'm jumping back and forth here a lot. I'm a little nervous, but... Um, throughout the whole thing, you know, all the, 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 what I'm trying to bring you back to is throughout everything, I just kept seeking my father and everything that I did, no matter what it was, no matter what sports I played. I, I played soccer, I ran track, I played football, I played rugby, and every time I invited my father to come to something, he would not, he would not come. Um, he lives down the street here. Um, we had a game at a junior high that was directly across the street from his house. Um, it was my very first rugby game that I ever played in, and you would have thought that the man could have walked across the street and watched one of my games, and he couldn't even do that. I treated my mom like crap through the whole thing. I drug her through the mud. Um, it was horrible what I put her through. Um, she knew that I was in, involved in drugs. She knew that I was involved with drinking. Um, I, I was also very suicidal. She came and picked me up from school one day and told me, you know, we have a meeting to go to. And she took me up to a place that's up off of Sixth Avenue that's supposed to be for troubled teenagers that are they're, they're to, there to help me and help parents <coughs> such as herself. Um, when I found out the reason why I was there, I lost it. I literally lost it. If I remember correctly, and I don't know all the stories about, but if I remember, I flipped the guy's desk, punched a window, and left. And they looked at her and said, ma'am, we can't help you. And that was the gist of it. And so she, now we have this lady sitting in the office in tears, wondering what she's going to do, how she's going to get away from this. She's got to come back out and deal with me at the car. And um, so I went back to school, and um, that was it. So Lamenta Lam Lamentation says, Our fathers have sinned and are not, and we have borne or have been punished for their iniquities. Um, so I feel that, you know, I felt that, you know, no matter what my dad, I didn't know a lot about my dad's past. I know that he did some time in the military, but I felt that I was being punished for everything, you know, by him, no matter what I did, no matter what, what nothing was ever good enough in his eyes. Um, I, j I didn't know how to get myself out of it. I didn't know um, what to do. I didn't know where to go. So fighting and drugs and alcohol was my was my life. That was it. Like I said, I looked up to my uncle. And I looked up to my stepfather. Um, to kind of jump backwards a little bit, you know, motorcycle riding was my life. Um, I remember my uncle telling me that if um, you know, if I attended his wedding and if I did a good job, that <clears throat> I would be able to go on this motorcycle trip with him. And so I, I did. I, I, I still look at pictures to this day remembering, you know, I was in a little brown tuxedo. And, you know, I was made sure I was on my best behavior to, um, to so I could go on this motorcycle trip. Well, long story short, he ended up going on his honeymoon instead. And I ended up getting stuck with his two of his best friends. Well, on this particular motorcycle trip, we were up in Wildcat, which is just outside of, outside of Copper Mountain, and the one of the gentlemen that I was with ended up deciding to take advantage of me. So I was, uh, you know, touched in inappropriate ways um, and stuff like that. So, you know, a lot of people say that, you know, I have it easy. A lot of people say, you know, they ask if I'm an addict. I don't believe that I'm an addict, I don't believe that I'm an alcoholic, I believe that I have all the capabilities of being one. I've gone through as many trials, if not more, or some maybe less than a lot of you. 
it was all about the choices that I decided to make at a very, very young age. Um, and that was by seeking, uh, seeking a better life, by making a choice. Um, you know, I grasped a hold of my mom. You know, I was raised by her, by my sister, by my grandmother. So, you know, sensitivity on my side was, I was very, I always have been a very sensitive person. Um, I can cry on, on <laughs> Thank you, Jim. <laughs> For those that don't know, Jim and I went to high school together, so he knows a lot. He's been, he's been around here a lot and stuff like that. But yes, believe it or not, I do have a sensitive side and, and all that. Um, the, the part of the things where I started to make my change at was seeing my mom hurt. Um, knowing that she cried herself to sleep almost every night. I know that she prayed for me every single night. And I do believe that if it wasn't for her prayer on almost a nightly basis, I would not be where I'm at today or who I am today. Um, when I was 21 years old, I was stabbed twice. Um, I still got the scars to, to show for it. Um, believe it or not, I was actually an innocent bystander at a party on this one, simply standing up against the wall. Um, Dick and Mary were at in Las Vegas, and the one thing that my sister and the one time my dad did show anything was is that he actually showed up to the hospital that night. And I believe that the only reason he did show up in my mind was is because you know I was about that close to death. Um, when I got stabbed in the chest, it actually almost punctured my lung, and if it would have got a half an inch further, it would have hit my heart and killed me instantly. Um, I was very very adamant to my sister and my father about not calling my mother because the one thing that I didn't want to do was ruin the Las Vegas trip. <laughs> so I didn't want to have to put up with, you know, with that. I didn't want to be let down. Um, so generational curses is beyond a learned behavior. Um, you know, learned behavior is, uh, you know, if you have a messy room, uh, you know, if, if the parents live in a messy house, you're going to almost expect that the children's room is going to be messy as well. Um, you know, but the, the biggest deal of it is, is it's also spiritual bondage, you know, and I believe that that's how it gets passed down from birth to us. It's no different than, you know, children becoming addicts if their parents are addicts, you know. And as the video showed, is, is that it is passed on through a spiritual passing. And I believe that, you know, I kind of got the run into the stick when, when I was born into the Brewer, the Brewer family. Um, and the Brewer family, meaning my father. Um, my grandfather wasn't that great of a guy. He was very closed off. Um, my uncles, as I said, they were both, they were all actually very, um, they had anger issues. They, they were drinkers. We come from an Indian background, so of course they all they did is drink and, and smoke dope. And, um, you know, my my uncle and aunt. There was uh, there's been molestation on both sides of my family. Um, my uncle ended up molesting both of his stepdaughters and then shot his wife and shot himself. Um, so, you know, I've been through a lot. I've been through it all. Um, there's so many stories that I could tell you guys that would probably, you know, that would turn your stomachs and, and are trying to, you know, not jump around too much. But the past, the fact of it being is, is that we all deal with the generational curse. We deal with that, that um, spiritual bondage from generation to generation to generation to generation. And just as it says, is that it will be passed on through third and fourth generations, you know? So, Getting back to the story with Julie is is that um, you know I, when we were when I first met with her or when we first got together and stuff I knew that she was the one. Well, you know we were all at about the age of 17 we started talking about kids and even to the fact of that um, you know what happens if we do get pregnant because we weren't practicing safe sex we weren't using condoms she wasn't on the birth you know the birth control pill none of that and it scared me. But as soon as we started really talking about kids, it scared me. And I sat there, um, and so, you know, that was it for me. I was done with her. I didn't want to experience those kids. I didn't want to experience that. So I ended up going, moving on to a 
second girlfriend by the name of Mona. And Mona become, became a very good friend. She came from a similar background of an abusive father. Um, she had it a little bit worse. <coughs> she had a stepfather that molested her um, and stuff like that. Well, Mona ended up pregnant. And, um, you know, we were in high school and we didn't know what to do. We were lost, we were scared. Um, so, you know, at the time, you know, we did what we felt was best for um, the child. Um, and that was, is we ended up getting an abortion. So, um, now I had that guilt on my conscience and that stuff to deal with. Well, about not too long after the abortion, I finally made a commitment to myself at a very young age. I promised myself that no matter what happens to me, that if and when I ever do have children, is that I was always going to make sure that they didn't have to have the life that I did growing up. And I don't want to. I don't want to make my life seem miserable because my mom. I have to tell you, she, everybody here knows. You know, you think she's phenomenal here. You should have seen her as a single parent. Um, she strived. She worked. She busted her butt constantly to make sure that you know this spoiled kid standing up here in front of you had what he wanted. And she did. She made sure that I had everything that I wanted. There was food on the table. Um, you know, I had a nice warm bed to sleep in. I had nice clothes. Uh, you know, and so uh, my life wasn't horrible, but there was a lot that was stuffed. I'm a stuffer. I love to stuff stuff. You would never usually, Shay knows, and there, anybody knows me, they don't know when something's wrong with me. They don't know when something's bothering me necessarily because I stuff it. Um, I don't like to talk about it a lot, but we do. So, um, some t you know, some of the symptoms of generational curses and spiritual curses are um, is a continual negative pattern of something being handed down from generation to generation. Um, family illnesses, um, continual financial difficulties, mental problems, persistent fears, depression, drinking, drugging, and it goes on and on and on. Um, you know, we. We have to make a decision and a choice, though, at some point in time to, or what are we going to do with those generational curses? Are we going to allow them to affect us? Are we going to use them as a crutch, and is what I say, you know? Um, you can walk around with those crutches underneath your arms for, the, for eternity, um, and you're never going to get out from underneath of them. Uh, you know, if you look at football players, you know, they go out, they tear an ACL or something like that. You know, they go through surgery and they're off those crutches as fast as possible. They go through that physical therapy, they push themselves through it, and they're off of it. I see so many people that love to hold on to those crutches because it's an excuse to relapse. It's, 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 it's an excuse for them to continue to drink, to drug. Um, I'm not saying that I'm any better than any of you, um, but I am saying that I did make the choice. I chose not to allow the drugs and the alcohol the molestations, the rapes, the, the um, fightings, the fears. I chose not to let those things affect me. I made, like I said, I made myself a promise at a very young age that I would not pass these generational curses on to my children. Um, Exodus 22:18 says, he knows that one of the most prized possessions you have is your children. And then, and therefore, it makes sin a lot harder to commit when you realize that you are not the only one that is being punished for it, but also your own children are going to pay for the price of your foolishness. So I have to agree and disagree with this because sometimes, you know, I believe that in, the situ in my situation, I don't think, you know, my father's not a Christian man. I don't think that he knew what he was doing, who he was affecting, and how he was affecting it, you know? Um, but through, you know, with me and through going to church, you know, we used to go to church every Sunday, whether it was in Boulder, Colorado, or Denver, Colorado, we went to church every Sunday. And that's where I believe that my choices kicked in. Again, I think that it was a, uh, not a generational curse, but it was a you know, it was an exercise that was passed on from my mother to me as far as going to church and realizing the difference between right and wrong. 
um, and doing what was right. Um, so the choices, you know, the good news is, is that once you accept Jesus Christ, the transference of bondage stops from your ancestors by means of generational curses. You can no longer receive spiritual bondages in the manner from your parents once you accept Jesus. So I, I know that I accepted Jesus at a very young age. I'll never forget it. We were in Boulder, Colorado, and we were at a YMCA. I know that I was baptized. Um, but the biggest one was is when I was standing in the auditorium, and I was very young, you know, I was fairly young, and the, we were in youth group, and the pastor asked, you know, who knew Jesus Christ? And, and, and as soon as they said the Father, I knew that there was something there to that. I knew that because that's what I was seeking my whole entire life as a fatherly role model. Um, and so I went down front, and, I, and that's when I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Um, the, so as soon as I realized this, and as soon as I had kids, I knew that this was going to be the change in my life. It, the day that my daughter was born, Amra, I wish she was here, but um, she's, I guess, working the years now. So. But when, as soon as my daughter was born, um, my life changed. My whole entire life flashed in front of me in a very... Um, brief amount of time and, um, everything that I had the way that from the way that I treated women especially as far as sexually treating them as an object um, as soon as my daughter was born I thought that I was doomed I, I really did um, because the only thing I could think of is everything that I had done to every woman every woman in my life and, you know with the anger um, the sexual the way I treated them and uh, so, anyways, um, one of the things that I, the other things that I have done is I've strived to teach my children and educate them about shutting the doors from drugs, alcohol, molestations, and those types of things. I'm sure that you know, working here, being here, you know, my kids, they hate hearing what Jay and I have to say to them all the time. They hate hearing those, um, you know what drugs and alcohol do to you. They hate hearing all those things. I'm sure that, you know, it's probably like growing up with a father that's a cop, you know, you don't, you don't ever want that in your life. You know? <laughs> um, and that's, I think, the way that my kids, you know, have my, are my kids perfect? By no means. Have my kids gotten drunk and have they smoked pot? Absolutely. Um, but I think the difference of it is, is because I've talked to them since they, you know, since they were so little about those situations. And, you know, look, we're only human. We have to go out and do our own research. We have to go out and do it on our own. Um, but I do know that they have come back to us and they've talked to us about it. And, and you know, um, I can say truly today that I do feel that I've broken those generational curses over my kids. Um, I do believe that they're not addicts and that they're not alcoholics and that, you know, that they have been taught and brought up in that mannerism of, um, breaking those generational curses. And so now I know that with what I've given them, that they now can take with their own experiences and pass that on to their children. And so I know that I've started um, in motion the breaking of the generational curses, you know. And, you know, it's like I remember when my sister got married here not too long ago. I hadn't seen my dad or talked to him in quite some time. And I think that it was probably it was about 10 years ago that they got married. So one of the things that my sister did is she came to me and she said, look, you know, I want to invite Dad to the wedding. And I said, well, it's your wedding. Do whatever you want. You know, and, she, and immediately she said, well, yeah, but I don't want the problems, you know. And I said, no, I said, for one day I will, I will mind my P's and Q's. And so we ended up, the wedding started up and everything, and then watched my dad, and he was talking to the pastor. And... Um, you know, me and myself, I was standing at the bar and I ordered two drinks and sat there and said, you know, everybody said, oh, he's going to go give his dad a drink or whatever. And I said, no, don't dump down. And I was <laughs> plan, you know. And so my dad had his back face towards me and I, I approached him and I tapped him on the shoulder. And one of the things that he did is he turned around and he went to shake my hand. And I sat there and I looked him in the eyes and I grabbed his hand and I pulled him in and I said, uh, father and sons don't shake, they hug. And so I gave him a hug. And we got to talking, 
and I, the one thing that I told him, and I'll never forget the look on his face, and I'll never forget how proud I felt because of the way I handled myself was, that I told him, as I said, I just want you to know that I appreciate and I thank you for everything you taught me of what not to be a father. And that was all I needed to get from him, and I closed that door for eternity with him and me. You know, I knew that that was all it was. I didn't have to knock him out as much as I wanted to. Um, if I would have probably thrown that first punch, I probably wouldn't have stopped, but I knew that it was my sister's day, and I didn't want to be that embarrassment in my family and my sister's day. So I do believe that God put that on my heart to address that situation with him, because that's what closed that door and freed me from that bondage on that side of my family. You know? was, it, was it difficult? Absolutely. It was very hard. Um, so Galatians 3.13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Um, so when we become, when we're born again and we accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and the Savior, it says right there in His words, the word that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. So I believe that that's when you know, my bondage started being you know, lifted and when things started changing um, is with that. However, just because that change, that change started doesn't mean that we can't go back in that direction. It's always easier, it's always easier to fall than it is to move forward. Um, you know, it says, have you ever involved yourself in any sin or opened any doors in your life while awakening and trigger <clears throat> or triggering the spirits? Um, then it is most, it, it's most important that you clear up any legal grounds of strongholds that you gave the enemy in your life relating to your bondage. Um, you've heard Mary speak about our eyes are our pathways. Um, so those things that we see, you know, is something as simple as a smile, somebody smiling that you can change your day. But it also goes that it's something as simple as um, going to a demonic movie. If you go to a demonic movie, you know, you might you might think that it's just, oh, it's just a movie, or it's just this, um, but really we're opening those doors of fear or anger. I mean, how many how many's gone to the old Rocky movies and you go walking out and the first thing you want to do is go out and start a fight with somebody? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've all been. And, you know, so if it's if it's e you know it's easy for us to see that example of going out and you know with a rocking movie and we get all excited and we're ready to go fight somebody, but yet when we're watching a scary or demonic movie, we don't sense it in the other in the other way. You know, it's just like oh, it's no big deal, but in reality, we're actually triggering again that key word triggering um, those spirits of our past, and so. You know, it's easier for the it's easier for the devil to attack us and to tear us down. You know, and to bring back those old memories of, well, you remember that time that you know you were beaten or that you were molested or that you were raped or you know whatever those situations are. Uh, it's easy for those thoughts to be triggered back up, and then what happens is, is we open that door now with that demonic movie. And so now we sit there and we wallow in our own self-pity and our own hatred and our own guilt and, and all that stuff. And so we continue to go out and we continue to drink to stuff that or use to stuff those those feelings, you know. Um, you know, it, it can, it, an example of that is, is, you know, we've all, I'm sure, been in that situation of having a parent um, at a very young age you know, to where we're running around and there's a beer laying on the table or whatever. And, you know, you look up at mom or dad and you got the beer in your hand and you take a drink of it. Those are those, are those um, you know, partial generational curses of those doors that were opened up. You know, maybe some of us have partied with our family or, you know, drank and got high or whatever it may be. Um, so we have to learn to make the choice. Again, the word choice is a very powerful word because God has given each and every one of us free will. We have free will. A lot of people say, well, why does God allow that to happen to me? Or why did God do this to us? It's not God that did that. It's the devil that did that. The devil stole that joy or that victory from you 
God wants you to choose to seek His face on a daily basis. God wants you to choose to sit down and pray. You know, it'd be no different than if I came in every morning and when Roland and I we come in and I sit down and it's like, hey Roland, how are you doing? You know, he always comes and makes sure how we're, I'm doing and stuff like that. I'm having a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship, a conversation with him. That's all God wants. That's all He wants. Is He wants us to He wants us to seek Him in everything that we do. We're not puppets. And he's not the puppet master. We're not robots. You know. Um, So, one of the other things, um, one of the biggest things for me that I that I had to struggle with for a long time uh, was forgiveness. Um, unforgiveness can be one of the most detrimental things in your life, I believe. I believe that if you carry unforgiveness towards anybody, um, that that will haunt you worse than any, than any of your other things. It will tear you down. I believe that it's one of the, the biggest open gateways for the devil to come in and to um, kill, steal, and destroy your life. So, as, as Mary and Ashe and several others can probably contest, is that I am, I am one of the most forgiving people that you will ever know. Um, I can forgive on a dime. I usually end up forgiving before you even know that I've forgiven or before you come and ask for forgiveness. And the reason being is, is because I don't want to carry that baggage with me. I don't want to lug your garbage along with it. You know, whether it's me needing to forgive you or you needing to forgive me, I don't carry it. If I have wronged you in one way or another, usually you have a usually you have an apology and me asking you to forgive you within a matter of seconds after that that wrong left my mouth or not doing it to my mouth. You know, um, it's just something that again I chose. I, I chose these decisions. I chose to talk to my children. I chose not to let pornography ruin my life. I chose not to let a rape ruin my life. I chose not to allow drugs and alcohol to ruin my life. It's a choice. They're hard choices. And that's why you have to surround yourself with people that are here, you know, or, or open your mouth and talk to people. Um, they're not easy, but again, it's a choice. It's your choice to stay sober. It's your choice to get high. And I know that, you know, I see David back there shaking his head because, you know, a while ago, about a year and a half ago, I started a Wednesday night group, refocus. <laughs> And um, that was our subject of conversation for about, I don't know, eight weeks. Yeah. It's, it's choice. Um, we had a lot of bantering back and forth, but in the end, I always won. I always won. <laughs> and it wasn't because of the fact that, that I felt you know, that I was right or anything. It was just because of the fact that by the time we got through discussing that situation, um, you know, the facts came out at the end. And, and it always ended up is that yes, you do have a choice. Um, you know, as I said, you know, we could go back over it again, but you know, I had every reason to become a drug addict. I have every reason to become um, an alcoholic. I had every reason to become a, a horrible father. I had every reason that I could have or should have, you know, uh, beaten my kids. You know, um, that's the one thing is, is I've never raised a hand to you or all my children to leave me. I've wanted to, and um, but I haven't. You know, I might get angry, I might yell, but the one thing that I've never done is raise my hand to them. Um, have they gotten spankings? Absolutely. But there's a difference between a spanking and a beating, and that was one of the areas where I promised myself that I never would do that. So. Um, Matthew 6.15 says, uh, which creates ample legal grounds for the enemy in your life. Unforgiveness in itself puts us into the enemy's hands. So again, we're putting ourselves into the enemy's hands. We're allowing our enemies to have that on against us. Um, I know we're running short here, but one, you know, one, a couple more examples just real quick, and then I want to close in prayer. Um, <coughs> This is very difficult for me to talk about, but um, a couple years ago, my sister used to work for my uh, mother, 
Um, I've always done what I've always felt is right for my sister. I've always protected her. I've always looked out for her. Um, she needed anything, I'd stop, drop everything on a dime and go over and help her. It used to take Shay so much because she's like, you know, Shay, I think Shay felt like, wow, you drop things faster for your for me than you do your sister. And um, <clears throat> so, the, you know, we there was a fight that broke out in our office not too long ago, um, and it was over greed and jealousy. Um, my sister's always called me the golden boy, and so it's kind of an ongoing joke with us, and especially me and Mary, um, that I'm the golden child. But my sister brought an accusation to the table about, it's been three years ago now, I think, five, about five years ago. Um, she brought an accusation to the table and, and with, my, with my mom and said that I'm less than her. So, as with me, it, it broke my heart because, as I said, I always have strived to make sure that my sister is always protected, that I always looked out for her, and I couldn't believe that she would come up with an accusation like that about me. Um, I think the Mary seen that it bothered me greatly. Um, I, I do believe still to this day that she believed me about the situation, um, but Mary did one, one more thing, and what she did is she took me in and had a polygraph test done. And it was more for um, the sake of my sister than it was for me. I knew in my heart the right. I believe that Mary knew the right. I believe that Dick knew the right. Um, but we had to do it. And so we went in. Of course, you know, I passed. There was no issues. Um, but it was just one of those one more things for, you know, that unforgiveness door being open. And I, <clears throat> excuse me, I immediately once I knew that the tests were done, and I didn't even, before I even knew the results of it, but once the test was done, I had already forgiven my sister for that accusation. Um, it was tough for me to do, but again, by closing those doors and those generational curses, I closed it and it was done. So, um, I have a couple prayers that I'd like to do with you guys. <coughs> Close this, and so, as, we, as I pray this prayer, um, when I say the iniquities of my parents, what I want you guys to do is I want you guys to name, and you don't have to do it out loud if you don't want to. Um, so we'll just simply close our eyes and I'll pray. But as I say that, I'll pause for a minute, and then I want you guys to name the specific people in your life that have passed those generational curses down to you, whether it be a sibling, a parent, a grandparent, and then at the same time, I want you to think of one thing that you specifically need to forgive a grandparent or parent for. Um, so if you guys will, you know, we'll go ahead and get started with this. So if you guys will all bow your heads and close your eyes. And then just repeat this after me. Um, in the name of Jesus, I confess the sins and iniquities of my parents. My grandparents, my grandparents and whatever specific sins and all other ancestors, all other ancestors. I, declare I declare that by the blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus these, sins these sins have been forgiven and Satan and his demons, and Satan and his demons can no longer use these sins as legal grounds in my life. In the name of Jesus, and the power of his blood, I now renounce, break, and sever all curses that have been handed down to me from my ancestors. In the name of Jesus, I now lose myself and my future generations from any bondages passed down to me in the, in, from my ancestors. In the name of Jesus, I declare myself and my future generations from any bondages passed down from me to my to my children. To my children. Amen. Amen. 
All right, so one other thing that I've wanted to do for a long time is <coughs> if I can have everybody close their eyes and bow their heads one last time, I, I believe that it's time that we ask those, and I don't want anybody looking around because I know how hard this situation can be sometimes. But if those of you are questioning whether or not Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, or you're not quite sure of that situation, and you would like to, I would like to pray the sinner's prayer and the acceptance of Jesus Christ over us. I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hands or um, put it up. You guys, you know who you are. But we'll do one last quick prayer and then we'll, we'll leave. So I repeat after me one last time. Father, Father I know that I have broken your laws. I know that I have broken your laws. And my sins have separated me from you. I am truly sorry. And I now want to turn away from my past sinful life. Towards you. Please forgive me. And help me avoid sinning again. I believe that your son Jesus Christ died for my sins. Was resurrected from the dead. He is alive and hears my prayer. I invite, I invite Jesus to become the Lord of my life. To rule and reign in my heart from this day forward. Please send your Holy Spirit to help me. Obey you and to do your will for the rest of my life. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Thank you guys for allowing me to be here today.